we're going to be talking to someone very particular about how he became extremely sought after in the music industry. And now he has his own speaking business. He speaks globally on the rules for success, helping people to tap into their own power, helping people to tap into their own purpose. And, you know, one preface to this is I remember when I was 14, 15 years old and I got my first iPod. And I had no music to listen to. All my friends were listening to hip hop. You know, it was like 2008, 2009. And they were listening to, you know, Beyonce and Jay-Z. And while that music's incredible, I remember going down to my dad's study. And I remember grabbing all the CDs that he had piled up in his CD holder. And there was bands in there like, you know, Led Zeppelin and Def Leppard and specifically bands that really made a dramatic impact in my childhood, like John Bon Jovi and John Cougar Mellencamp, and the Smashing Pumpkins, and all these incredible bands. And one thing I didn't know at that time was all of these bands had one thing in common. They had an extremely sought-after drummer who recorded with them, who toured the world with them, and who created these iconic hits with them. And some of you may know who this drummer is. His name is Kenny Aronoff. And for those who don't know Kenny, Kenny has recorded and toured the world with many artists that you've absolutely heard of, including John Mellencamp, Sir Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, The Rolling Stones, Lady Gaga, Bruno Mars, Sting, Bob Dylan, Meatloaf, B.B. King, Rod Stewart, and extremely, most recently, John Fogarty. Kenny began his rock career touring and performing with John Cougar Mellencamp for 17 years. When Mellencamp decided to take time off, Kenny was motivated to embark on his own. He fulfilled a lifelong goal, performing on stage with Sir Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr, as well as countless other professional musicians during the CBS special, The Night That Changed America. And he became a sought after session drummer as well as a touring drummer. Today, Kenny Aronoff spends his time touring, recording in the studio, and teaching people how to embrace adversity and gain confidence in their personal and their professional lives. And he is here with us today. Mr. Aronoff, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Brandon. That's such a great introduction. I, I don't think I have to say anything more. Have a nice day. <laughs> Literally. You know, the thing about this show is we talk a lot about purpose. And listening to your story specifically, you said that from a very, very young age when you were watching the Ed Sullivan show, you realized your purpose. Can you give us like an idea of what that looked like for you? Like when you watch the Beatles perform on Ed Sullivan... How did you know that being a drummer is what you wanted to do? Well, first of all, uh, where I grew up in uh, the uh, hills of Western Massachusetts, there was nothing to watch on TV. I mean, they didn't even have cable back then. We had my mom. So me and my twin brother outside playing, as we always were. And one day my mom screams at us to come inside. We thought we were in trouble, which was usually the case. And... We enter, we go running in. Well, I'm 10 years old. We go running into the house expecting to be, you know, uh, reprimanded about something. She's pointing to this black and white RCA TV set, which had the rabbit ear antennas to get better reception. And there's four guys on the TV in suits, but they weren't like the typical business suits. They were like, they were cool suits. And everybody had an instrument like bass, guitars, and there was this drummer up on a high riser and it's, they just look so cool. And they had long hair too. And the lead singer went up to the uh, <clears throat> microphone and said, she loves you. Yeah. 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 And then they broke into rock and roll and I'd heard rock and roll on the radio. Cause it was like the new thing. And uh, I'm flipping out. And it was at that split second, as you mentioned, all I knew is I want to do that. I'd ne I was electrified. I was, it was, I'd never felt that feeling before. I was jumping off the walls. I was like, it was like a high. It was like a drug. And so I don't know where they're from. I don't know who they are. And I go to my mom, who are these guys? She said, they're the Beatles. I went, well, I want to play in the Beatles. Call them up. Get me in the band. You know, I'm 10 years old. That's what you do. You ask your mom, you know, to do that. And I now want to play drums. Forget about the piano lessons. For, ugh. I want to play drums. I want to do that. Well, she didn't call the Beatles and she didn't get me a drum set either. And I was really bummed uh, because, I mean, how do you do this? There's no 
There's no internet. There's no TikToks. There's no Instagram. There's no YouTube. When am I going to see these guys again? Where do I go? Who do I talk to? There's no mentor. It's all new. So I, I started my own band called the Alley Cats. I, all I could afford was a snare drum and a cymbal. We played Beatles music. And so that was the beginning of this excitement of like, oh, my God, this feels good. And, you know, I'll, as an adult, I look back and I go, wow. You know, if you think about it, playing the drums, it's a physical thing. It's an emotional thing. It's a mental thing. And it's a spiritual thing. But what was happening, if you want to get on another level, it was creating adrenaline. It was creating, uh, you know, uh, serotonin and dopamine and oxytocin, a chemical reaction inside me that excited me. And I think if I look back at my life, I was gra I gravitated towards playing the drums because it felt good. Mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Just like when I was a jock, too. I was into sports and still am you know, uh, into health and staying healthy. Those things stimulate me and make me feel good. So why wouldn't I do that? So that's on a more of a, on a whole different way of looking at it. But anyway, as you mentioned, 50 years later, who would have thought that I was going to get called to do a CBS special where I get to honor the Beatles for that TV show, which was the Ed Sullivan show. That was the night that changed America. Uh, 70 Two or 73 million people saw them and it completely flipped them out. Because you remember, there wasn't much on TV back then. No video games, no iPhones, nothing. This was historic. So for me to get to play with them 50 years later, honoring them, I get to play with the two remaining Beatles, Ringo and Paul McCartney, was ridiculous. Not to mention, you know, Jeff Lynn from ELO and Dave Grohl from Foo Fighters and, you know, uh, Joe Walsh from the Eagles and Joe Walsh, James Gang and you know, uh, Brad Paisley and, and Keith Urban and John Legend and, and uh, Alicia Keys. I mean, it was off the charts. Yeah, and, and I think it's an incredible story. And there's much more to this story, which we're going to tap into right now as well. But I think what you said is really important. Back then, there wasn't really a lot of things that even played on the television, right? There weren't cell phones. There wasn't social media. There wasn't all these distractions for the younger generation that's coming into things. And things obviously now are a lot different than they were. A lot of people now, because of all these distractions, they struggle to find that thing that you were able to find at a very young age. Has anyone like ever asked you, Kenny, you know, you figured this out when you were so young, what it is that you wanted to do with the rest of your life. Has anyone ever asked you how they could find that for themselves? Like what advice would you have for someone who is struggling to really mm -hmm. find their own place? That's a great question, Brandon. That's the big million dollar question. And uh, uh, when I've been uh, giving, you know, uh, been an inspirational, motivational speaker for seven years, you know, that's the thing I always ask myself, what can I give to people that can change their life? Not just tell them my story and my story, uh, it can maybe trigger some things. So to answer that question, what I tell people is, you, it's not all up here. I mean, uh, thoughts or ideas. Ideas are just thoughts and intellectual things. Um, but feelings are the truth. Feelings are your deepest desires. Uh, you know, how you feel emotionally. Um, I mean, because um, emotions are your being. And emotions and feelings and your being is where your purpose lies. It's not up here, it's in your heart. So observe yourself and 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 see what excites you. Now, maybe being the most popular person on TikTok excites you, but that is not a long-term business. That is a that is a fleeting moment. And to stay on top of TikToks for more for uh, you know year after year and year after year is a very difficult thing to do because things change so fast you got to find something that has deeper meaning that that you're willing to invest many 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 years because i believe you can change your purpose in life for me it was always music and because playing the drums and being in music was so powerful 
and had so much meaning to me. And it was a very, very long uh, a road to become Kenny Aronoff. I mean, I got my ass kicked. I've been fired. I've been crushed. I've been embarrassed. I've been, but the reason, because I followed my heart and it truly was what I am and what I want to do, that when John Mellencamp fired me from the first record I was on after only being the band for five years, it was me realizing that that was my purpose when he told me to go home from LA back to Indiana. I told him, no friggin' way. I mean, what, what is that? It was a fight or fight mode because he was trying to, not directly, purposely, but if I look back, he was stealing my purpose. He was taking away the deepest thing I wanted to do, which is be in a rock and roll band, make records, tour the world, be on TV, you know, on and on and on, playing big arenas. He was stealing that from me. It was at that moment as I look back that that obviously was who I was and what I wanted to do. So when he tried to fire me, I said, no. I'd be like, if I said, you're fired, and you go, no, I'm not. You go, you're fired. And you go, no, I'm not. And you go, what don't you understand about you are fired? And so I negotiated a deal with him, which was, well, I said, you know, I was backed into a corner and I'm like, well, am I still your drummer? And he was perplexed, and the band was like, wow, what's going on here? <laughs> Is it going to be a fist fight? You know, he says, well, you're not the drummer in the band, but you're not, you're the drummer in the band, but you're not playing on the record. So I went, well, I'm going to go into the studio and watch these other drummers play my songs on your record, and I'll learn from them. I'll get better by observing, and that'll be good for you because I'm your drummer. And he said, um, nothing <laughs> and i went well um all right you don't have to pay me and i'll sleep on the couch and he went okay i mean what boss doesn't like to have an employee that works for free now the point of this story is that was obviously coming from a place of feeling in my heart so much that i wanted this so bad that i was telling the guy who was firing me that i'm not fired so the lesson here is to observe yourself observe yourself and see what stimulates you and what you're willing to work hard for if it's a coming from a place of of feeling and in your heart you will be willing to sacrifice and work and i don't mean one day i'm talking for 10 years because I'll tell you a short little story. When I, I studied classical music, because I'm so old, there was no school of rock back when I was a kid. So I studied five years of classical music in university, four of which was the number one university in the country, still is, for classical music. Indiana University School of Music, or they call it Jacobs School of Music now. This is not a hand-holding, coddling type of institution. My teacher was ruthless. I walked into my lesson the first day without a pencil and eraser. He threw me out and gave me an F for the day. There was no, like, nice boy. You show up prepared or you get your ass kicked. And, I mean, I'd be practicing, you know, three to five hours a day on just my exercises for that lesson every week. But that made me who I am. This is, But staying in the game was all fueled by purpose and desire. I wanted to do this. There was nothing else I wanted to do. I had to do this. And my mom asked this teacher the first day I, she brought me there from Massachusetts where I grew up and said, Mr. Gaber, I mean, is Kenny good enough to make it? I mean, is this, she's looking at this big school, an opera hall bigger than the New York Met. We, it was a massive music school. And he looked at her and said, Mrs. Aronoff, how the hell do I know? Ask that question in 10 years. His point was, it's up to Kenny, and it takes 10 years. It takes 10 years to become really great at something, and it takes longer to stay great at it. That's being Tom Brady, the greatest quarterback in football. Why at 44 is that guy still doing it? Because that guy's still coachable. That guy's still working hard. That guy is still doing things mentally, physically, and emotionally 
before he even walk and spiritually before he even walks on the field it's a lifestyle it's not just playing football it's a lifestyle and then he gets to the position where he's asking for the ball to be hiked then it's adapt or die in other words once you make it doesn't mean things are going to run smoothly all of this is supported by purpose and desire and the love for what you do. So back to the question, observe yourself and see and fight for it. What is it that really excites you? That feeling that you had when you were eight years old, when somebody maybe in school said, hey, Johnny, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a rock star drummer, or I want to be a lawyer, or I want to be a this, I want to be a skateboarder, I want to be a downhill skier, I want to be an architect. The, when a kid is asked that, and they come up with those answers, it's only coming from a place in their heart. So go back or observe yourself now and what is it that excites you, and then go after it. Yeah, you know, there was a lot you just said there that is extremely powerful. I mean, imagine how different things would look if you had just gone home when Johnny Cougar said, Hey, Kenny, go back yeah. home. You know, this isn't for you. We're going to bring a different drummer in who's recorded hit yeah. albums. Right. And you didn't say, okay, you know, I'll go home. I'll listen to him. You, that, that voice inside of you, which I want to talk about that voice. You said specifically in the past that it's almost like there was this angel that spoke through you. And I want to talk about that yeah. and get a little spiritual here in a few minutes. But the thing that's really stands out about you is you have completely created your life. Like, yes, you discovered your purpose at a very young age, but it wasn't until you were 27 that you had the opportunity to audition for with Johnny Cougar. So there's that giant gap in between where you've talked in the past, you were literally practicing eight hours a day, seven days a week to become the best in the world at this one thing, which is music and drumming. And even when you got that audition, like you were still told to go home in which you then said, well, I'm going to stay, I'm going to watch, I'm going to observe, I'm going to grow. Yeah. There, there, you know, the thing about you too, is you have this, this air of humility that a lot of people, especially I can imagine people in the music industry, I can guarantee 99% of them are going to be as humble as you are. You constantly say, I'm looking to learn. I'm looking to grow. Like when you see other people in the music industry who are hot for a year, two years, even maybe three years or more, what is it that holds back and causes many musicians to stop going, to stop staying consistent that causes them to become irrelevant? What do you think that is for a lot of people? Well, there's no one answer for that, but I mean, uh, I mean, I have to say some of it is your DNA, the way you are made. I mean, and so some people have a, a, a tolerance to stay in the game more than others and, and fight for what they love do, doing. So there's that factor, um, which we don't have any control over really, but being aware of it, it helps because then you can then realize, oh, okay, I've got to push myself. I've got to. I mean, if you want to do be great at anything, it's it's repetition. It's the thing I called RPS. The repetition of any skill is the preparation P for success. The repetition of any skill is the pre preparation for success. And so that eight hours a day, seven days a week, starting at age 18, the day after graduate high school, was in classical music. I mean, I was learning mallets, timpani, stereotype, how to read, because I knew I was way behind. Because at 13, I was playing in clubs, playing rock and roll. but had nothing to do with classical music. So I devoted all a, a massive amount of energy into classical music during a lot of those years. And when I eventually made it, into the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra. I had a job, I turned it down, completely blew everybody's mind because I had worked so hard to get that great at something I was not great at and then turned it down. Why would I turn it down? Why would I turn down certainty for complete uncertainty? Why would I turn down a gig, a paycheck, a job? There aren't that many orchestras. Certainty for possibility? Rock and roll. 
Who was I going to call up? Jimmy Page? Hey, I want audition. I didn't know him. Who was I going to call up? You know, somebody in this band or that band. I didn't know where to begin. I had to go back home to my parents' house humbly with my tail between my legs and start practicing eight hours a day, seven days a week on only drum set, studying with a teacher in New York and a teacher in Boston. And for one year, and then going back to Indiana and starting my own band for three years, living in a band house, you know, making no money, trying to write songs to get a record deal to then go on, make a record and go on tour, the business model for rock and roll. That didn't happen. I mean, it was four years of me struggling, trying to get back into rock and roll to make it the way I wanted to. And then I get the audition with Mellencamp. And I mean, I, I crushed it because I took all that discipline that I had been doing for the last nine years and put it into that audition and won the audition. But the reason why, and here's a big thing, the reason why I didn't get to make that record, it was the producer of that record, realized I had zero experience getting, making, recording drum tracks on songs that get on a record that become number one hit singles. And if I ask a drummer, I could ask a thousand drummers, unless they listen to me tell this, I'll say, what is the purpose of a drummer when you're making a record? And they don't get it right. They go, well, beat time, I said no. The purpose of a drummer, the end game, is to get the song on the radio to be a number one hit single. Isn't that what we're trying to do? So it's about me serving the artist, the song, the the other musicians, the producer, the record company, the engineer. It's me about serving all of them. It's not about me. It's about we, the team. That's why a guy like Tom Brady is so a badass. He's a superstar. But when he walks on the field... At, at camp or in practice, he embraces everybody on that team because he knows that he needs them to work with him. He needs them to work with them. It's teamwork. And that was a huge pivotal moment when I got fired by Mellencamp and realized, wow, I've got to learn how to be a drummer that will serve his songs. It's not about what I want to do. It's about what can I do to get that song to be successful that gets it on the radio to be a number one hit single. Those are huge lessons I learned. Yeah, you know what they say in, in any industry, the one who serves the most is the one that wins. The one who is out there helping the person you are there to help. And I remember someone asked you the question like, you know, does it ever get frustrating to be not in the spotlight and you say, well, you know, you have to always be going back to this mindset of I am this person's employee. And you even told a story about, you know, even mm. when you work with a 15 year old songwriter musician, yeah. it's like, okay, yeah. well, what's your vision? What can I do for you? You're not automatically assuming that you are, you know, the master here. You're not, you're not letting your ego get in the way. And I think that that's huge. No, absolutely. I mean, you, you, we, I am in the business of serving. Even, even <laughs> you want to look at even the president or a king of a country, he's still serving his people. Because if you don't serve the people, eventually you get thrown out. So we all serve. And, and, and at least you need to be aware of it. I have a phrase that goes like this. I'll never be as great as I want to be but I'm willing to spend the rest of my life trying to be as great as I can be. That's a humbling position. That's like being a running back in football. They don't get touchdowns every time they get the ball. They spend their entire career play by play, game by game, season by season to get into the end zone. That's all they're focusing on is their job is to get in the end zone. Their job is to work with all the people on their team and to serve. And they've got to keep their ego in check. So if some 15-year-old kid hires me to play on their song, it's their song. They're the artist. Yes, I know a lot about how to make it work. 
But still, I'm fully aware I am working for that 15-year-old, no matter how many gold platinum records I have on the wall, which is around 1,300. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's like I'm in the service business. But it goes deeper than that. <clears throat> if I play great in a recording session and everybody else is not playing great, it's up to me to motivate them to play great. This is what you call co-elevating. We together have to be great. Because if I'm great and they're not great, it might not make it on the record, which might not make it on the radio. So it's about me motivating and getting people. It's, it's about me not being just about me. It's about me being involved with us. We all have to be great. So whatever I can do to help that song sound great, is important teamwork well said and it's look at where it's brought you look at where that principle and and look at who that principle has allowed you to create music with it's it's that mindset of service that mindset of giving and, and i want to ask you a spiritual question because you've said before you know in that moment that you know john mellencamp said Kenny, we want this other guy to come in because he's made hit albums before. And he effectively yeah. said, you're fired, go home. You said that there was almost like an angel that spoke to you in that moment that helped you to form words that caused you to stay there and observe the other drummer. And you also said when you showed up a year and a half later to record the second album, right? And this is where, you know, Jack and Diane came from mm -hmm. during that drum solo for Jack and Diane. You said that it was almost like that force, that angelic force was with you again. What is that force that you were channeling? What do you believe that voice to have been? And has that voice returned for you at specific times? And if so, like, when does it return? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think you expected that answer. I mean, there, there I, it's not, obviously it's nothing that I can shake uh, the voice's hand or anything, but I, as I step back and observe my life, I'm like, wow, some of the most difficult situations you have survived and persevered, not necessarily in an enjoyable moment, those situations, but somehow the right words or the right action, I took the right action or said the right thing. And sometimes I'm amazed that, wow, we, I, it wasn't anything I calculated. It wasn't like practicing something and I know what I'm going to say. It's, it's something that's deeper than that. It's like a belief that you've got this and a belief that there's something uh that's in you or that's around you that is there that that is not in the conscious mind that is got your back i don't know any other way of saying it and having and and almost like shame on you for not believing that sort of thing when it it does exist observe yourself Observe your life and see where you have had this other support. Let's call it uh, uh, from the universe or spiritually or something that you're like, wow, I, I wasn't going to make that decision. Why did I turn down the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra? I looked in the mirror in shock that I turned it down. But thank God I followed my, as I called it, my heart. But the heart goes into a spiritual, universal thing. The heart is not like you can't grab it. It's not a thing. It's a feeling. And feelings are spiritual things. And tied to the universe and this stuff that we can't quite touch. That force, the more you believe in it, the more you at least be open to it, the more things I think will be possible in your life. It's a scary moment when you trust in something you can't touch or see like visually, but it's there. I mean, if like I told you a couple of stories, no, Mellencamp, I'm not going home. Where did that come from? There was a, a thing inside me that gave me courage. Even if I, even though I was freaking out, I was freaking out. I felt like a loser. I felt like I was uh, overwhelmed. I felt fear. I was angry. But what was it that gave me the, 
the guts and the energy to do do this? Was there somebody on my shoulder going, you know, I wasn't going like, ah, we got this, yeah. And I felt cocky. I was shaking in my boots. But there was something powerful that gave me the strength to do that. Same with turning down Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra. Same with all kinds of different things I've done in my life. Relationships. Breaking up with people is not an easy thing because for me, it's scary because you're going to hurt somebody and yourself. It's an emotional thing tied in with triggers and all kinds of stuff. But something is very, there's something there powerful enough to give you the courage to make these very scary moves. That's basically the only way I can explain it. You know, you said at first, which is funny, you say, well, I don't know what that is because like, you're right how we, we can't exactly yeah. say with certainty that we know exactly what that is. But I think you explained it beautifully. I think you followed your feelings. You trusted yourself. You trusted your instincts and that gut feeling where when you were in a situation of extreme pressure, you were able to push through it. You were able to make the right decision, even when at that moment, intellectually, you didn't know what that right decision was, but instinctually you did. And you allowed your instincts, your automatic behaviors to take over. And from others I've worked with, and the reason I ask you that is because you knew what the right thing to say was because of how much you've practiced and how much you've tapped into this purpose and how much you've trusted that this is truly what you've meant to be doing to the point where when he said to you, Kenny, go home, it was almost like he was attacking your purpose, right? In your mind. And, and that automatic instinct took over at that point. And then you've said too that once you recorded that album and it was his, I think you said it was his first number one hit, right? Jack and Diane, it was his first number one song. Yeah. You said that you were worried about how you would replicate that and how you would do it again. Yeah. How have you been able to confront this pressure type situations over and over and over throughout the year, like throughout the years, do you have like something you think, do you have specific self-talk that you give yourself? Because you must find yourself in, in very high pressure situations very often. Like, oh, yeah. and I'm sure now it's automatic, but how do you talk to yourself through those situations? Well, it's taken a very long time to be at least a slightly bit trusting. And I wouldn't say comfortable but trusting in that I got this. And no matter, like I said, no matter how great you are or how many accomplishments you have made, I mean, I'm humbled by, by that, that sign that's behind you, always trying to be better. I'm humbled by the human being is perfectly imperfect. Tom Brady he won. I keep going back to Tom Brady. It's very difficult to get into the Super Bowl and to win is outstanding. But to win two in a row, never done before. To win seven after being in 10 Super Bowls, never been done before, may never be done again. But it's definitely never been done before. That's extraordinary. Does that guy make what they call bad calls? Or See, I don't believe in mistakes or failures. I'll repeat that. There are no mistakes or failures in life. Those are just events that help you become better at what you're doing. So if you have that mindset, you have to humbly, you know, uh, deal with your emotions, which are triggering all kinds of stuff when you were a child. You know, when your dad yelled at you, or your mom or your coach or your teacher or your priest or your whoever. The thing is, you have to set that aside, which is a very difficult thing because emotions are more powerful than your brain. Thoughts are not as powerful as your heart. So, but you have to be your own coach. Tom Brady is the coach and the player. Kenny Aronoff is the coach and the player. So when the, the player starts to get freaked out, the coach steps in and says, Kenny, we've been here before. Things can go not the way you wanted to. Uh, there I am at the Kennedy Center Honors. The President of the United States is up there. 16 camera shoot. It's live. I cannot make a mistake. But if I do, 
I have to just push it aside and look at that end zone. Per- person, if you focus on your mistake or that thing they call a mistake, you will fail over and over again. It's like a running back. If somebody hits them, you got to ignore that you're being hit. You keep moving your legs. You keep twisting and moving forward. That's what those great running backs do. They don't stop until they hear the whistle. Even when they're on the ground, you keep moving, 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 moving. It's a mindset. Keep persevering. Keep moving forward. And you push your emotions out of the way. They get in the way, especially if they're old, triggered emotions when you were a kid. So, yes, when I get on that drum stool and I'm about to play with Sting and Lady Gaga and Bruno Mars and Bruce Springsteen and Elton John, one after another, I'm sitting there. We've only rehearsed a couple of days. We've made edits two, up till two hours before the show. We're running one song after another. And I'm reading music. And I'm getting made edits. Sting comes up to me, you know, 10 minutes before we're going to go on. Hey, could you do this? Write it down. You don't want to mess up. And I know that something could go wrong. Not even with me. Somebody else could make a mistake. The artist could make a mistake. I am aware that that thing, things can not go the way you want them to go. And I have to feel like I got this. I got this. Sure, I'm going to feel freaked out and nervous and stuff. But I have learned that you can persevere through all these things. Look at Tom Brady in the in a Super Bowl makes one wrong pass. And he loses the Super Bowl. He lost three Super Bowls. Why did he? He has to go back and go, okay, very disappointed. But what did I do that I can do better next time? That's the lesson. Everything is a gift. There are no failures. There are no mistakes. They're all gifts to make you better. Damn. That's that's inspiring, man. Focus on... Focus on the result. Don't focus on what could go wrong. Don't focus on the right. mistake. See them all as gifts and use those gifts to continue getting better, continue improving. Mm-hmm. And yes. I mean, you've been doing that all these years, man, working with so many different people. I mean, you must have so many people that reach out to you, especially now. Like, How do you decide at this point in your life who you want to work with and make music with? Well, I always say yes. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, yes. First, first response from my mouth is yes, and then I try to figure it out. I mean, the biggest thing, the components of my life are sessions. I have a studio called Uncommon Studios LA. People send me files. I just recorded ten songs last night. Six for a a documentary about the Holocaust. Uh, one from a, I don't know where this other person's from. Uh, two from a guy who's a singer, uh, a producer songwriter uh in la he's it's for some artists stylistically completely different more like hip-hop meets heavy rock meets alternative uh it's a unique style and then another artist that is from uh, chicago area i write every single thing out I'm, I'm i'm well known for writing very detailed charts here's a here's something out of a book i just put out is an idea of like here. This is a chart for uh, a, a Rod Stewart song. So I write everything out, see, and then when I go into recording, I've already played through it because my my approach to recording now. This is when I'm in my studio. Is I want to perform. I don't want to be working anything out. So I can. That's why I was able to do ten songs over eight hours yesterday because I was prepared and ready to record when my engineer came in. All right, so there's this whole recording world that I have as a business. Then there's the performing, the live performance thing. So I've, um, you know, I've been performing with John Fogarty on and off for 29 years. I've got other things. I'm gonna do two shows with the Almond family, Almond brother family. That's a, a Devin Almond, who was Greg Almond's son and Dickie Betts' son, and I'm a guest drummer. So I've got two dates, so they call me up. Can you do these dates? I went. Uh, I can December 17th in Vegas, December 19th in LA, but then there's uh Fogarty dates, but then there's Joe Satriani dates. I just did his last two records and we're 
putting dates together for next year. And then there's uh, other sh gigs with different bands uh, that I, I have. And so there's the live component, and there's TV shows, and then there's a, a tribute. To, uh, I just did Kings of Chaos featuring Ann Wilson from Heart, Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister, and Billy Gibbons on my day off on tour with Fogarty. Uh, you know, I had that show. So before tour, we spent three days rehearsing. I'd write all my charts. I would get the tambos right. The rehearsal, this is without the singers. With the singers was that sound check. One run through of every song. That we didn't even run through LaGrange with Billy Gibbons because we all knew it. And then I do the show and completely crushed it. All the tempos, all the fills, all the beats, everything. Preparation. Preparation, remember? Repetition of any skills of preparation for success. You rep, you know, while I was on the road with Fogarty, I'm rehearsing these songs so that I will be excellent on the day of the show. Nothing happens by accident. There are no accidents. You make your success. You make your success. You make it. If you're waiting, success doesn't land in your lap. You're not born successful. If you're waiting for success to happen, it's guys like me that come by and take what you're waiting for. Not because I'm trying to take what you got, because I'm trying to get forward at what I'm doing. And it might be something you want to do. Don't be lazy and don't be entitled and don't wait for success to come. You make your success. And to be successful is difficult. To stay successful is even more difficult. Wow. Execution. You're right. You you absolutely create the life that you want to live. And, you know, a lot of people ask questions like, you know, if you could go back to 25 year old Kenny and give him a piece of advice, what would you tell him? I don't like that question only because you can't go back in time to tell that version of you a piece of advice. But what you could imagine is imagine if 95 year old Kenny Aronoff goes back and talks to you who you are now and gives you a piece of advice or tells you something that could change your life, what would you hope or what would you want that older, more wise version of Kenny Aronoff to tell this version if you could choose? Or what do you think he would say? Well, what I would say is keep doing what you're doing, but at the same time, step out of yourself and observe yourself. Observe every day what you do, what you did. Observe your life. Feel the feelings because the true Kenny Aronoff is telling me stuff all the time. Like, I I don't want to do this. I'm saying, yeah, we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know that feeling. It's like, well, I don't feel like doing this. No, we have to do this. I'm not saying that there are times, you know, like, I don't want to get up and do uh, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't want to work out today. And so... Obviously, I make myself work out because I know that I will feel better in the end. And I know that's healthier for Kenny Aronoff in order to do anything. My point is to observe yourself and make some wise decisions. That would be the older, and it wouldn't be 95 because I'm going to live to 120. So let's say 100, yeah. 110. The 110 year old guy would say, continue what you're doing, but make, take inventory. Observe what you're doing and what can you do to make things work better? And this ties into mental, physical, emotional, spiritual health. Because you could be loving, let's say I love playing the drums so much and I'm not getting enough sleep. Now, where sleep now, I believe, is the only way your brain and body can repair itself every night. I'm not a great sleeper. But you do need seven or eight hours of sleep, even though I get up five times a night. The point is, I know that the sleep is better. My heart is excited. I want to. I can play drums fourteen hours a day, but this the, the 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 your wisdom goes. Yeah, but Kenny, you will be only be able to play your drums two hours a day if you get sick. Notice how I said I'll still be playing when I'm sick. But the thing is, that's where taking inventory and observing yourself that even though you still want to do it, the wise man tells the, the coach tells the player that's enough for today. And that's a tough, that's a struggle for me, but at least I understand that. 
Yeah, I, I like how you keep going back to this idea of observe yourself, observe your thoughts, even on days where you know you, you don't want to get as much sleep, you know it's necessary. On the days you don't want to work out, you still do what's necessary because you know yeah. that that's where the longevity comes from. Yeah. And I want to ask you, I know you've got your your rules for success, right? And I know you probably have one that stands out above all others. But before I ask you that, you are, I mean, you've been in this game for so long. You're widely sought after in this industry. But the thing is, there's a lot of amazing drummers out there, right? And these artists amazing. who call you back to tour again and to record again, like they could maybe go find a quote unquote better drummer, right? You know, not saying that there is better, but there's, there's always someone who's at the next level. Yeah. They're calling you back for skill, but how much of it would you say is skill versus what your personality actually is bringing to the table when people want to work with you again? That's a great question because I asked myself that back in the nineties, I'm going like, God, I'm, I mean, I had drums in Nashville, LA, you know, uh, New York, Indiana, where I was living. I had a drum set in in Japan and Germany to because I was being flown all over the world to make records. I was going like, I kept going, man, you you are not the best drummer in the world. I mean, I could list about 40 drummers like that that are like, wow, I can't do that. And then I started realizing that, yes, yeah, some of it is uh, my ability to connect with people, my ability to communicate with people. Look, when I do a session, let's just pick uh, Elton John. When I went into the studio, I went right up to Elton John, started to connect with him, start communicating on a, on, a, on a steeply sincere level because I want him to like me. He wants me to like him. So then we can collaborate. We can make music. And Don was said in my autobiography, Sex, Drums, Rock and Roll, he said, I hire Kenny because he motivates the room. He saves my sessions. And it wasn't just on a playing level. It's a, more of a personal level. When you motivate a room, you're somebody that they want you in the room. If you're a talented musician and you're a pain in the ass and you're trouble, a producer is going to be reluctant to hiring you because you're going to make it more difficult for him to do his job. So, yes, I get hired probably because of my teamwork skills, my ability to get along, my ability to motivate the room. Uh, it helps the whole environment. That's why in a sports world, let's say football again, they hire certain players that might be at the end of their time as an athlete, but they motivate the team. They motivate the people on the field, in training camp. That's a big factor. You got to be easy to work with. And I, I had a feeling you were going to say something like that because like, I'm not in the music industry, but I can imagine you being in the room elevates the energy and the enthusiasm of every single person who's in that room with you. So, so I suspected a lot of it had to come down to personality versus just skill, right? Yeah. And it, it's yeah. very apparent too that health is really important to you. And like, listen, you're behind a drum set every single day for hours, but at some point your body gets used to that and your body gets used to doing the same motions every single day. So you can't attribute just you playing drums to your health. You have your rules for success. Would you say that health is one of the top rules? Or if you had to pick one of those rules that trumped all others, what would you say that rule for success is? Well, health is number one. If you're not healthy, you can't do anything. And I have the, you know, a healthy life is a wealthy life. And a wealthy life is a healthy life. I mean, so I have the eight steps to health, but I'll just run them by real quick because obviously we're running out of time. But, you know, the first one is uh, lifting weights, which builds muscle mass, but it also keeps your immune system up because it keeps your hormone levels up. And your hormone levels start depleting when you're in your 20s. You know, uh, cardio, only way to exercise the heart. Obviously, if the heart goes, you're dead. Also gives you endurance and it also keeps your hormone levels up, which also elevates your immune system. And you, we have to have a great immune system. Flexibility, yoga, stretching. Now you've got flexibility, strength, endurance, flexibility. Diet, I won't get into that, but you got to eat healthy. Th uh, five, supplements. I take a lot of supplements, things that keep me healthy because I work ridiculous hours 
and I travel a lot. So I've always been on a supplement diet. I get blood work done every year. Uh, my doctor is very much into supplements and stuff. He analyzes my blood work and makes adjustments. So like I'll take things like, you know, D3, uh, you know, which uh, is uh, great for your immune system, quercetin, zinc, uh, you know, multiple vitamins, fish oil. I can go on and on. All right. Number six is water. Every organ in your body needs water. The rule of thumb is take half the amount of body weight in ounces. If you don't drink water, you, you know, you can, you'll die in three days. If you don't eat food, you can live for 40 days. Water is huge. I could be better at that. And beer isn't water. I used to think, oh, man, <laughs> there's water in here, right? Anyway, so um, <clears throat> number seven is uh, meditation, some form. I'm not great at it, but some form of breathing exercises. I, I do breathing exercises. You want to get rid of the whole purpose is you want to get rid of anxiety and stress. Stress will make you sick. That'll bring you down faster than anything else. So some form breathing exercises, everybody. Look at this guy, Wim Hof. W-I-M-H-O-F-F or H-U-F-F, H-O-F-F. He's a breathing exercise expert. It really reduces stress and inflammation. And finally, number eight is sleep. The best way to repair your mind and body. Thanks for going through all those, man. I mean, it's health is, like you said, it's everything. You can't enjoy success if you don't have health, right? And it's, yeah. it's very clear that you place a giant focus on that, which is why you will live to 105, 125, whatever it might be. So I, uh, I had no doubt that that was one of the top rules. So I appreciate you going through each of those with us. I'm telling you, I mean, the thing is you guys, I, I have a thing called the, the 10 commandments and the 10 commandments aren't like the, like what Moses brought up on Mount Sinai, the same purpose though. Those are just things to look at, to remind you, Oh yeah, I, thou shall not do that thou shall not do that you know what my 11th commandment is if i were to add one on the tablature thou shall not bullshit yourself <laughs> i mean what i'm saying is look at you can bullshit other people don't bullshit yourself be honest with yourself be honest with yourself you have a fighting chance of doing the right thing but these commandments which one of them is health man it's just those eight steps you go oh man didn't get enough enough sleep last night it's just to remind you you should be getting more sleep. So you don't go like five months without getting enough sleep. You go, ah, got to get back on track. We're not, you know, we're perfectly imperfect. Those who, and by the way, with regard to 10 commandments, I did this once, write down the 10 most important things in your life that you think are good for you, you know, and follow them. What are they? Write them down. I will be more, honest. I will be a harder worker. I will be better in my relationship. I'll be more, whatever it is, and observe them. Uh, you know, I will not do this, whatever it is. I mean, those aren't the greatest examples, but they're, you write them down. It just kind of keeps you in focus. Well said. And I want to respect your time. So before I ask you what's coming up in, in your life right now and what, what you've got planned here, I know you got some gigs going on next month. Um, I just want to say to everyone in the description, you'll find a link to Kenny's book, Sex, Drugs, Rock and Roll, The Hardest Hitting Man in the Show Business. Go check out that book. It talks all about Kenny's stories. It talks all about his rules, everything. I mean, it goes deep into what we talked about, plus a ton more. And somehow you found the time to write a book while you're doing all these other things, which is absolutely incredible. As as well as Modern Drummer just released um, another, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They released an issue yeah, all it's, about it's, it's just, it, I happen to have it. It's called, it's Modern Drummer has the Legend series, and I'm honored and flattered that they made a book of me. But it's cool. It's a, 150 pages, pictures, charts. I was on the cover four times, so it's got the cover stories, but a new interview. And then every song, like big songs like Blaze of Glory, Meat Loaf, I'll Do Anything for Love, but I Won't Do That, Puddle of Mud, uh, you know, Psycho, um, Mellow Camp songs. I do it. I do a story about that session. Uh, it's amazing. And, and it was my mom sadly passed away this year. The only time I ever took a picture of her, ever, on my drum set, only one picture, and it was on my iPhone. And, and I, <laughs> isn't that great? And That's I dedicated, I dedicated, I dedicated it to her. The only time all my life that I got her on my drum set, I've never seen her on my drum set. Took a picture, so I dedicated it to her. But that's that's a cool book, and uh, yeah.
Anyway, I'm glad you got yeah. that photo, brother. It looks great in that magazine. Yeah. So, yeah. Kenny, in this final minute here, what do you what do you have planned coming up here? Okay, so that's in my studio. Um, <clears throat> I'm doing some videos for a Joe Satriani record that we just did. I'm doing some videos with Supersonic Blues Machine on a record that uh, I did during, you know, a couple of years ago, actually, but the pandemic slowed down. I'm doing two shows with the Armin family, one in Vegas on December 17th, December 19th at the Wilton in L.A. I'm a guest drummer, I think, on four songs. I've got, I'm in this super group with Kenny Wayne Shepard, Mike Wanchek from Mellencamp, Mike Mills from uh, REM, uh, 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 Mike Ramos, who played with the Bodines and Mellencamp, Tom Bukovac, one of the greatest session guitar players ever, who plays with Ann Wilson right now, but he also was in Fogarty with me 20 years ago. And uh, we got the super group, we're doing a few gigs. Uh, and then, um, uh, also, John Fogarty, of course. I just did two weeks with him. I just did a Kings of Chaos gig. More of this next year. And uh, I'm work finishing up a third book that I started in the pandemic, which is an actual drum book. And today I'm actually recording the drum exercises that go with this book. It's got, uh, I think, uh, 12 songs I recorded that I didn't necessarily, I mean, they're like like an Almond Brothers song, Midnight Rider, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Uh, song, uh, a Pride and, uh, and, and, and Joy, and demonstrating different techniques. Uh, Le Freak, this is a song, Le Freak, different styles of Maiden Voyage by Herbie Hancock, demonstrating different styles of drumming. Because the fortunate thing I've had in my career is I didn't just, I made it as a rock drummer, but I play every style of music. And thank God I get hired to do these different things. Like the same guy who records with Johnny Cash, Chris Christopherson, and William Jennings, and and uh, uh, Willie Nelson don't usually end up on a Smashing Pumpkins tour. And that's the beauty of my career or work with Leonard Bernstein from the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I mean, the conduct, one of the greatest conductors, composers. So that's the purpose of the book, to show that you can, even if you become famous at one style of drumming, you should consider playing all styles because they influence the style that you're most known for. Very cool. You've got a lot going on, man. And uh, I appreciate you being generous with your time today. And just thank you for, you know, replying to my email, getting back to me and sharing all these insights with everyone watching. I really appreciate Excellent. it, brother. Thank you so much. Kenny. Awesome. Thank you, buddy. And be better. <laughs> Always looking forward to your continued success, my friend. Okay. I'll talk to you Take soon, care. brother. Bye, everybody. That was Kenny Aronoff, one of the heaviest hitters in the music industry to this day. And guys, I just got to say, you know, the way that I found Kenny was I connected with Dr. Rob Bell and he sent me a copy of his book and Kenny wrote the foreword to Dr. Rob Bell's book, which the title is Puke and Rally. And I reached out to Kenny, not expecting him to get back to me because this guy is literally someone who tours and records with the biggest names in the music industry. And he messaged me back the next day and said, Brandon, I'd love to be on your show. This guy made time for someone with a much smaller audience, someone much newer in the game. He beautifully enunciates his principle of giving, 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 service, wanting to help other people. This guy is literally recording album upon album, touring the world, yet he still made the time to be on this show to give us his insights. So again, links are in the description to Kenny's book, Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, The Hardest Hitting Man in Show Business. I'm going to link you to the Modern Drummer edition, the Modern Drummer Legends, where uh, he was just pictured on that magazine it goes over all the the drumming stuff it goes over all the drum charts it goes over the story behind each of the the big songs so i hope you got as much out of this conversation as i did and if you did be sure to share this show with one person who could use this information one person who will be entertained or who will find value from this show thanks so much guys for tuning in it was super fun talking to kenny and until you and i talk again next time continue to be better